Ronaldo Henley, the CEO of State Street, Lynn Martin, President of the New York Stock Exchange, Dan Schulman, the CEO of PayPal, Mark Susman, the CEO of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and Mohammed Al Jadan, Finance Minister of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Steve started by taking a subtle dig at El Salvador over its Bitcoin adoption before giving the stage to the panelists. Lynn was the first to speak and literally said that extreme financial centralization is required to protect against unwanted volatility. Hence why I included this panel under financial centralization. The next to go was Mark, who was wearing a pin that many have associated with the WEF's Great Reset agenda. In reality, the PIN is a reference to the United Nations' Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, which are being pushed by the private sector via ESG with the help of the WEF. More on that later. Now, I must admit that Mark spoke as if he was outright instructing all the institutions present as to what they ought to do regarding the economy. The only thing more cringe was watching Dan push the talking point of blockchain, not Bitcoin and outright saying that the financial system must control this technology. Ronald took a different route because he shed light on the fact that nobody really knows how much debt there is in the financial system or who holds it. A little later, Ronald was asked a question by a young global leader in the audience about sustainable finance, one of the many ESG synonyms. Ronald said that ESG investing has been hard because most environmentally conscious companies are grassroots startups that can't receive massive amounts of funding. Ronald also said that Wall Street wants to quote, securitize national resources. This is code for taking possession of all land and sea, turning it all into stocks and trading them on the stock markets. Lynn confirmed that natural resources will soon start trading on the stock exchanges thanks to the SEC. Pure evil. Okay, let's lighten the mood a little bit, shall we? There were two panel discussions related to cryptocurrency. The first was titled, quote, Finding the Right Balance for Crypto. Bloomberg News Editor Stacey Marie Ismail was the moderator and the panel featured the following not-so-crypto personnel. Klaus Knott, President of the Dutch Central Bank and Head of the Global Financial Stability Board. Mairead McGuinness, the EU Commissioner for Financial Stability. Brad Garlinghouse, the CEO of Ripple. And Omar Sultan al Olama. Minister of Digital Economy of the United Arab Emirates. The discussions were predictably anti-crypto. What was not predictable, however, was that even the moderator would be vocally anti-crypto. Stacey Marie started by asking how it's possible that FTX was licensed in Dubai, and Omar had to explain that there are multiple levels of licensing. Mairead explained that the EU's upcoming MICA regulations will not stifle innovation, but prevent crypto from becoming a wild west. Plus said that crypto companies are located in, quote, sunny places with shady people, and said that the FSB would be publishing crypto regulation recommendations by the summer. As we've seen with the Financial Action Task Force, or FATF, the regulation recommendations made by these unelected and unaccountable international organizations are anything but. Failing to fall in line typically means that the institution or country faces sanctions or restrictions on Western entities. At the same time, Brad started blasting Stacey Marie for implying that the UAE has a quote, light touch when it comes to crypto regulation. Stacey Marie doubled down on her anti-crypto rhetoric by asking Omar whether it was true that 35% of people in the UAE were affected by the collapse of FTX. Omar had no idea where that statistic had come from, so the mic was temporarily turned to Klaus, who was asked whether the FSB is keeping track of illicit activity in crypto. Stacey Marie followed up with Omar by asking him why it is that crypto criminals try to escape to the UAE. Omar was stunned. Brad butted in to point out that FTX was like Bernie Madoff's scheme, which had been reported to the SEC before it collapsed, but the SEC ignored the warnings for some unknown reason. Note that FTX founder Sam Bankman Fried had met with SEC chairman Gary Gensler on more occasions than with any other regulator. Glass added to the tension by saying there's a need for global crypto regulation, especially because the crypto industry will actively resist regulation, according to him. 
I would invite class to find an industry that's welcoming of regulation, that's not controlled by a monopoly that's paid by politicians. After Stacey Marie admitted that she didn't hold any cryptocurrency, it was time for the question period. The first question came from someone at Chainalysis, who asked class whether the FSB's figures for illicit activity in crypto were being overstated. Class implied that Chainalysis is understating crypto crime. The panel ended with Stacey Marie getting into a spat with Brad over the collapse of the crypto market. She asked when the crypto market could recover in an intimidating way that motivated Brad to highlight that many tech stocks have crashed more than some cryptos, yet you don't see calls for regulation there. Now you know why there were almost no crypto headlines about the only purely crypto discussion at Davos. Coindesk was the only crypto media outlet that covered this discussion and somehow painted it in a neutral light. Speaking of which, the second crypto-related panel discussion was moderated by Coindesk Chief Content Officer Michael Casey. The discussion was titled, quote, Tokenized Economies Coming Alive. And it appears to have been hosted in a suboptimal venue, though it featured the following surprisingly crypto-centric panelists. Jeremy Allaire, CEO of USDC stablecoin issuer Circle. Jerio Srupsisopa, CEO of Bitcup Capital. Timo Haraka, Finland's Minister of Transportation, and Beryl Lee, the co-founder of Yield Guild Games. More about those guys down in the description. It's definitely an interesting crypto project. Now, I couldn't help but notice Jeremy looking over at Timo, wondering what the hell a Finnish transportation minister was doing on a panel about crypto-related tokenization. This is because Timo admitted that he's not that familiar with crypto or tokenization, but was eager to learn. Well, Timo, I know a YouTube channel that can definitely help you with that. Now, as you might have guessed, Michael spent quite a bit of time going back and forth with Jeremy. Jeremy just explained how Circle is tokenizing the most important asset of all, which is, of course, the US dollar. Michael went on to press Jeremy about programmability and other stuff the WEF seems to love. Juriot spent his limited time in the spotlight talking about how Thailand is working on a wholesale CBDC, among other mostly irrelevant things. And Timo randomly started calling for clearer crypto regulations and got on with Jeremy about digital ID. Note that Circle is working on digital ID with its Verite platform. More about that in the description. Jeremy also saw eye to eye with Timo about regulatory clarity for crypto and the whole time Beryl was just sitting there watching the exchange in awe. During the question period, Jeremy was asked about non-custodial crypto wallets and said something that's arguably very incorrect. Jeremy said that when you have a stablecoin or digital ID in a non-custodial wallet, then you truly own both assets. This is not true because stablecoins are centrally controlled and can be frozen by stablecoin issuers at any time. Digital IDs are likewise connected to government issued IDs, which can be revoked. Anyway, the panel ended with Jiria talking about how he's been talking with Bill Gates about how to reduce carbon emissions, which is needed to know. Newsflash. Overconsumption is causing all the environmental issues we're seeing, and overconsumption is being incentivized by inflation due to money printing. If we had a hard money system that incentivized people to save rather than spend, then overconsumption would come down and all the environmental issues the elites claim to want to solve could eventually solve themselves without having to pass a single law or regulation or ESG mandate. More about that in the description. Now, I know this video is getting long, but there are two more panel discussions that I absolutely must cover. The first was titled, quote, Global Economic Outlook. Is this the end of an era? It was the final panel discussion at Davos, and it was also the longest. Don't worry, I'll keep it short. The panel was moderated by CNBC anchor Jeff Cutmore and featured some of our favorite overall. Kristalina Georgieva, Managing Director of the IMF. Christine Lagarde, President of the ECB. Bruno Le Maire, a French Finance Minister. Larry from Harvard and Kuroda Haruhiko, Governor of the Bank of Japan. Jeff started off with a colorful overview of each panelist. For Kristalina, he said she's concerned about a deglobalizing world. For Lagarde, he's concerned about green energy. For Christine, he said she is staying the course on fighting inflation. 
for Kuroda, he said he's fighting the bond market, and for Larry, he said he's the former Treasury Secretary. I suppose that's exciting enough on its own. Kristalina started by saying that the economy isn't doing nearly as badly as the IMF had initially projected. She said that China reopening should lead to a resurgence in its economic growth, but could also cause inflationary pressures. Kristalina said that the Ukraine war could be a risk as well, but mostly to Europe. She then revealed that the reshoring of supply chains that we've seen as a result of the pandemic and the war in Ukraine is going to do damage to global GDP, but this damage can be contained if countries continue to work together as much as possible. Recall the theme of this Davos conference. Larry urged central banks to continue fighting inflation and warned that the last part of the inflation battle is the most painful and difficult. He also said that global integration should never come at the cost of social disintegration, which is probably the only thing I agreed with from all the Davos discussions. Christine confirmed that the ECB will continue to fight inflation and amusingly said that 2022 was a quote, weird, weird year. She urged governments to stay the course on the digital and green transformation that the West stakeholders pushed through with their pandemic restrictions. More about that in the description. Now, Christine also casually said that China's reopening will kill lots of people, but it will grow the economy, so it's fine. She then proceeded to cross her arms after realizing what she had said out loud. They truly put the best, brightest, and most compassionate on display at the World Economic Forum. Kuroda said that the Bank of Japan will continue to fight inflation while aggressively stimulating the economy. This makes zero sense, but the chap is old and about to retire, so I reckon we can cut him some slack. Note that Kuroda is set to leave on the 8th of April. We could see lots of volatility on that date. Bruno was the polar opposite of Kuroda in his passion. He essentially said that Europe shifting its reliance from Russia's gas to China's renewables is stupid. As such, Europe should start to produce its own wind turbines, solar panels and batteries and be very protective of these industries. For context, US President Joe Biden recently passed the deceptively named Inflation Reduction Act, which creates huge incentives for green energy companies to relocate from Europe to the United States. This has angered the EU, which responded by passing the Digital Markets Act that hurts big tech profits. Bruno's passionate speech took the moderator by surprise, and he told Bruno to his face that he had made the audience uncomfortable 